okay wonderful so now we can get started uh, could one of us lead in prayer maybe kiran yes ma'am yeah go ahead we'll pray Father God, we come before your throne once again, and we want to just say thanking you, Father God, the new week, Father God, you've given us, Father God, thanking you, thanking you, Father God, for your presence, Father God, thanking you, Father God, help and give your wisdom and knowledge, Father God, that we can understand the subject, Father God, reveal more your uh, presence and your words, Father God, and clear understanding, Father God, give everything, Father God. Thanking you, Father, for upcoming time. Just submitting to your hands. Just take care of every side. Thank, thank you. Almighty Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you. Uh, so, in the last few sessions, we were talking about how the writer to the Hebrews really wanted the believers to be mature, but because of uh, the discouragement that they were going through and uh, uh, you know the maybe they did not hold on uh, hold fast to uh, the faith you know in the midst of the uh, challenges and the persecutions you find that they were somewhat slack and sluggish so though he wanted to explain deep things to them he couldn't so we began with uh, the uh, the truth that the lord jesus is the son of god then we saw how he put on humanity he shared in the uh, things of the earth uh, so that he could become a very uh, sympathetic high priest towards us and through him we have boldness to approach the throne of grace you know, all of these things we were looking at and then uh, the writer started talking about Melchizedek and then over there he digressed and he said look I can't talk to you about all these things uh, because you are not yet uh, mature enough to understand and then we we saw how he placed a warning before the people and said that even those who have experienced God in a powerful way, if they fall away, so we talked about falling away in Hebrews chapter 6, uh, that it is very difficult, impossible for uh, such people to be revived once again to their faith. So that's where we were, Hebrews 6. Okay, So see, there's a very big difference. Uh, I want to clarify that falling in the life of a believer, you know, sometimes uh, though we sincerely move in the path of righteousness, there can be moments where because of ignorance or uh, because of a lack of strength, we fail. Okay, Now, just because we fail or we have sinned, uh, it doesn't mean that immediately God is going to reject us. So that has to be very clear. We're not talking about just falling because the scriptures say that though a righteous man may fall you know, seven times, he will still rise again. But this is about falling away. Okay? By falling away, what we're saying is you know, somebody who uh, has sinned against God and we see how the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us, right? As in John chapter 16, we have uh, that revelation that the Holy Spirit will work in our hearts and keep uh, telling us about the things that we need to correct about ourselves. If we yield to the voice of God, then it's like, you know what we said, a righteous man may fall seven times, but he will rise again. Okay, Proverbs 24 and verse 16. But if one does not yield to the voice of the Holy Spirit or doesn't repent, if one continues in sin and becomes what we have seen earlier, hardness of heart you know, uh, due to disobedience and unbelief, the way uh, we were told that this kind of a heart condition will keep us out of the promises of God. 
Okay, so that is one thing. But if we continually move in this direction, we are going to be unfruitful for the kingdom of God. And there is a grave uh, uh, danger of us falling away from God. So there's a big difference. You know, the normal, regular Christian, we could say that, yeah, they may fall. But once you repent, you come back to God, it doesn't mean that God is going to reject us. But falling away means a person who willfully re rejects God. God doesn't reject them, but they have chosen a lifestyle and a heart condition, heart attitude through which they are rejecting God. Okay, So this is the understanding that we got. Now, we had come to a portion in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, this is verse 13, where there is still an encouragement to the believers that God's promises are sure. Okay? God's promises are true. So that's uh, what the writer wants to tell them. That why, why are you getting discouraged? You know, yes, there are things happening around you, but you can be sure that God does not lie. So from verse 13, what he uh, says here is, so I'll read it. yeah, I have it. So it says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So, here, God made a promise. So, our focus is the promise of God. When we are going through a challenging time, our mind can be distracted by the difficulties. But it is good for us to concentrate or focus on what God has said. Even though everything may look dark, God has spoken and said, you know, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So fix your eyes on the promise of God. Because similarly, God made a promise to Abraham and said, surely, Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. But what is the speciality in the life of Abraham? You see that he patiently endured. So when it comes to receiving the promises of God, we need some patience. Because we are from a generation where we want everything to happen fast. Okay, even to reach a certain place these days, bus is not good enough. Even your private vehicle is not good enough. We are looking at building metros because, okay, make it faster, make it faster. You know, just one example. But you understand, this is the kind of uh, attitude that we carry. But when it comes to receiving God's promises, you can't help it sometimes. It takes a while and that is why we need to endure patiently. So when we think of Abraham, always remember, how is it that this man received such, a, uh, incre such an incredible promise over his life? At 100 years old, he had a son. Wow. Because he patiently endured. We must patiently endure. That is how he obtained the promise. And then, you know, again, letting the believers know about the surety of God's word. You know, God's word, uh, there are different ways in scripture that we are told that God's word is uh, powerful. You know, Hebrews 4.12, we saw it's living and uh, it's living and powerful, like, you know, two-edged sword. That's something we saw. We also saw how heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. So the characteristic of God's word is that it endures. It is strong. You can put your faith on it. 
and you can depend on God's word. So again, here we are told that uh, what kind of promise did God make to Abraham? You know, at, uh, to Abraham, when he made an oath okay, or a promise, what he did is there was nobody to swear by. Okay, so usually they would swear by somebody who is greater than them. But in this case, you know, it, it's like there is no one required to confirm the word. God himself you know, is great enough and that word is confirmed. Then we are told that... Uh, God's promise okay, that it stands. Okay, so here it says, promise the immutability of his counsel, meaning what God has spoken, it's unchangeable. And then uh, we are told that uh, you know, God confirmed it because when God says something, you know, it's true. And he doesn't really need somebody greater to come and vouch for it and say that, yes, you know, what is being told is true. Because in this passage, we also read that it is impossible for God to lie. And through all of this, we can have a strong consolation. When we may, uh, let me put it this way, you know, when we are feeling low, and we are finding it difficult to believe. You know, did God really say, why is it taking so much time? You no, know, I'm waiting for my ministry to get started or I'm waiting for um, a breakthrough in my personal life or I'm waiting for my finances to be blessed. And then we sometimes wonder in the waiting, there can be moments of doubt. But, you know, again and again, he's trying to say, look at Abraham. You know, God gave him a promise. There was nobody greater to uh, vouch for it. But you know, God himself spoke, which was good enough. And also uh, God's counsel is immutable. Okay. And God cannot lie. So what God has spoken over us and our life situations is the truth. <laughs> Excuse me. Even if it takes a while, let us hold on and we will see it come to pass. And in what manner does God encourage our hearts? You know, sometimes I said we may feel low. Look at the words here. It says that we may have strong consolation. You know, when somebody is um, upset, what do we do? We console them. We say, don't worry. It's going to be okay. And in the same way, the word of God, no, it provides us with what kind of consolation? Not just, no, don't worry, it's going to be okay. But strong consolation, meaning we can be very confident that yes, God is there. He will work it out for me. I will uh, walk in righteousness. And, uh, you know, we are told that uh, there is something known as refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us you know god has he is a redeemer by nature okay and we see in the old testament that god instituted you know many redemptive acts if you even look at the year of jubilee every i think 25 years if i'm not wrong is when uh, people would be set free slaves would be set free and in the same way there was an opportunity for those who had sinned who had committed crimes uh, you know if they repent for them to go and live in something known as the city of refuge okay so there were these cities of refuge where those so-called unwanted people could also go they could live a life and uh, uh, you know live with purpose so you find that god always made opportunities for man to thrive even those who are seemingly rejected by the uh, uh, the the community around them so 
once again you know the writer is encouraging the listeners and saying that come on you know god is encouraging us and uh, there is a refuge or a place of safety to lay hold of hope said before us so god is giving us hope you know in our difficult situations and in our hopeless situations so you see uh, in this same passage what did he do he gave a nice warning and he said look if you are going to go away from god there is a danger of falling away and later he said but don't worry we expect better things of you so you find the heart of a pastor where it's not to crush the people or put them down but to awaken them and say that i'm warning you but let me encourage you 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 will make it don't worry you know you are uh, god is with you and you are capable of enduring through the hardship and keeping your faith so it's the overall attitude is to build up the hearts of the people not to crush them uh, even though there is a very uh, strong uh, sort of you know like a like a jolt in between the uh, passage here okay so he is encouraging them and he is saying look god has given us refuge there is a hope that we have in god so hold on to these things you know ultimately why did jesus come he came to give us hope you know uh, when paul wrote to the corinthians he said look we are the people of hope even if even if he talks about death in first corinthians 15 and he says even if we die we have hope of resurrection so we are a people who have you know immeasurable hope so he's cheering them up and saying come on hold on to the hope and about hope he says hope the hope we have as an anchor of the soul okay beautiful very beautiful uh, line here hope is what the anchor of the soul so once again if you look at a uh, ship and uh, uh, a ship that is brought back to the harbor usually they would anchor it to uh, to that uh, place so that it doesn't wander away and in the same way in our souls you know we can go through all kinds of emotions we can go through all kinds of thought processes but in the midst of everything if we carry hope which says i know that god is for me i may be uh, struggling right now but god will bring me out you know god will make a way god will open the door god is my redeemer you know god will give me the wisdom so what's happening outside you know there's all this turmoil but deep within what is the anchor of the soul hope so we must be careful never to live our lives without hope as believers we can hold on to that hope and here we are told hope is the anchor of the soul don't lose it don't ever lose it it will give you the stability you need in the faith and what do we hope about we hope about the promises of god because it's sure no we don't have to be afraid what he said he will do it so you know we are told that hope is there it has been given to us um, it is sure and steadfast and this is found in the presence of god from where do we get our hope from the presence of god uh, and also you know we know that it is jesus who um, through the sacrifice that he made you know that the veil was torn and uh, we got access into the holiest holy of holies okay so it is the work of jesus in that sense who has provided us the access to god's presence and the hope which is in the presence of god so whenever we come you know i don't know how many of you have experienced this but uh 
maybe we are very discouraged okay but we spend time in god's word we come away with a promise in our hearts and we say okay no problem you know i have hope god will work or you know you're going for a time of worship let's say you're singing and declaring and praising the lord you come away with a sense of hope because in the presence of god there is hope so the believer don't be discouraged believer be encouraged hold on to the hope which we have through jesus and in the presence of god we are told where the forerunner has entered for us you know forerunner is somebody who goes ahead of us who is this forerunner even jesus where did he enter he entered the presence of god okay through his sacrifice and what happened who generally enters the presence of god in the old covenant now who had the access to uh, the holy place and the holy of holies high priest yeah very good very good arrange so a high priest so now that we are saying jesus has entered the presence of god who do you expect him to be easy answer hey come on class somebody can say it okay great so prince is saying high priest that's the correct answer so the lord jesus having entered the presence of god like all the other high priests we recognize oh this is a high priest and what kind of high priest high priest forever according to the order of melchizedek now again what uh, the writer is really doing is this is a jewish audience and for the jewish audience they could accept the lord jesus as the son of god but because they were so caught up in their rituals you know they may have thought that you know isn't it good for us to go back to our rituals to have a high priest who would make the sacrifices in the temple for us you know so for them to go back to their old ways was a possibility out of what out of discouragement so they are being encouraged and they are being enlightened that what you have now is the real thing whatever practices were taking place under the jewish traditions you know as spoken of in the old testament they are just a shadow you have the real deal in your hands so why do you want to go back to your old ways hold on you know there is hope and jesus is greater jesus is uh, the 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 one about whom all these things actually speak so that's the intention of the writer here and he's helping them see as jews you know they want clarity uh, about the temple about the temple worship about the high priest you know all of those things about the covenant they need to settle in their minds that what they have in christ jesus is greater than all the things that they were proud about earlier so that is why he, he is letting them know that jesus he is the high priest directly in the presence of god and what kind of a high priest you know many different features of the high priest high priest forever and which order does he come from he comes from the order of melchizedek so once again he's going into that explanation of introducing why the lord jesus is so precious so we will understand that you know further ahead so we will move on to chapter 7 here of the book of hebrews okay now since he introduced the term 
or the name Melchizedek, he needs to explain it further. Now you would be amazed that this person, Melchizedek, is is uh, not mentioned you know, men, very many times in the word of God. In the book of Genesis, you come across an encounter which Abraham encounter or a meeting that Abraham had with Melchizedek. And that's the only place. And now again here, you, know, you have uh, this word about Melchizedek. And he says, for this Melchizedek, who is he? He is the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. So in the Old Covenant, we saw that generally there would be kings. You don't see a king who is also a high priest. If you recall, during the time of King Saul, he tried to offer up a sacrifice to God, but it was not accepted because he was anointed to be what? He was anointed to be king, not the priest. Okay, But the priestly ministry at that time was done by Samuel. Now, priestly ministry or prophetic, you know, he was the one who went and as a prophet, in fact, he was anointed. But you don't see the combination of a king and a high priest. So what is unique about Melchizedek? He was the king. A place is mentioned, Salem. And priest. Priest is again defined by the God whom they minister to. So Melchizedek is the priest of the Most High God, or we know, you know, uh, he is trying to introduce Yahweh to them because they are familiar with the Most High God. Abraham meets Melchizedek after he went for uh, a conquest, so he slaughtered kings uh, and. Uh, when he meets Melchizedek, okay, he does something. And that is, he blesses him with a tenth part of whatever he got. Okay, so we will look at it, uh, you know, okay, or I'll, I'll just tell you. So because of this, Abraham giving a tenth of what he had got, from slaughtering the kings, we have uh, this practice of the tithe. Okay? We tithe, isn't it? We tithe a tenth of our income to God. Abraham gave it to the priest. So technically he's giving it to God. Okay, So that's how it worked in the Old Testament. So it was given by Abraham as an honor. That's why we are told Abraham blessed Melchizedek. Now, who is this Melchizedek? A little more. We understood that he's found in the Old Testament. He's a king. He's a priest. He received a tithe from Abraham. His name is translated king of righteousness. And his name is also no, Salem translated king of peace. So what kind of a king is he? He is the ruler of righteousness and peace. Okay. So something very special to have a king like that. And a little more about Melchizedek. He did not have father or mother. That implies that he was not of a human origin. Very interesting, isn't it? So he has a heavenly origin because here on earth for us to be in the world as a human being, we are born, uh, uh, you know, through parents. But Melchizedek without father or without mother, which means he is a heavenly being. And then further, 
without genealogy so you can't track the human uh, tree ancestral tree for melchizedek so obviously he does not have that physical beginning or end and he says again we are told having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like the son of god remains a priest continually so it's a very special person you know this melchizedek and the uh, historians okay and theologians when they study about melchizedek they come to two conclusions one is they say okay this is a heavenly being um, who is honorable and many of them say that it could also you know if not just a heavenly being this could be uh, what we call as you know one of the ways in which jesus was presented early on in the old testament you know there you have some uh, uh presence of of uh, uh the person of the godhead okay uh, and uh, it could be jesus himself okay, that we are talking about in melchizedek so these are the conclusions that people come to but one thing we understood that this priesthood that melchizedek carried is very different it's not like aaron's priesthood at all okay now we will come back to that a little later now let's continue talking about melchizedek so when abraham gave what did he give what did abraham give melchizedek his tithe yes tithe so a tenth of the income that is a tithe when abraham did that it was as if the sons of levi okay sons of levi are the priests isn't it even aaron they aaron comes from the tribe of the levites so the sons of levi who of later on received the priesthood it was as if they from the loins of abraham tied to melchizedek okay now it simply goes to tell us that the priesthood of the levites blessed melchizedek and that the priesthood of melchizedek is in that sense more honorable than the priesthood of aaron that is what he is trying to establish so even aaron and all the other priests who came after him through abraham because where were they they were all still inside they were to be born so in the loins of abraham means the generations of abraham later on abraham isaac jacob and then the sons of jacob levi then the priesthood of the levites came about but the levites honored melchizedek through the tithe which abraham gave them now beyond all contradiction the lesser is blessed by the better here mortal men receive tithes but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives so in this equation you know melchizedek being the greater the lesser which would be the levites they blessed the one who is greater so even levi or levi whichever way you want to pronounce who receives tithes so the priests are the ones who receive tithes paid tithes through abraham so to speak for he was still in the loins of his father when melchizedek met him so it's like saying if you go back to hebrews 1 there he talk a comparison about angels isn't it and he said that 
even the angels worship jesus so elevating exalting jesus and showing that the position of jesus was much better than that of the angels and similarly now coming to the high priest the position of the high priest and telling the people all the high priests whom you honor they are from the line of the levites imagine even those high priests priests gave a tithe to melchizedek meaning they honored melchizedek so which is a better priesthood the line of melchizedek okay so that is the point that he has established and so you know he is continuing to say look if the levitical priesthood was perfect then there would be no need for or another priesthood in the order of melchizedek everyone could have just been a descendant of aaron and uh, you know continue with the work of god but god wanted to bring in something new so god wanted to bring in a new priesthood so from verse 13 we will just see that he introduced this early on for he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar so this means melchizedek the line of melchizedek for it is evident that our lord arose from judah wow what a contradiction the priest should be from the line of the levites but jesus is from the line of judah so it's very different of which tribe moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood and then you know he goes on to explain that though he was from the tribe of juda he has the priesthood from that of melchizedek he is another priest who has um, risen in this way not according to the law of the fleshly commandment but according to the power of an endless life because it was god who spoke and said you are a priest forever according to the order of melchizedek so god is the one in psalm 110 and verse 4 who spoke to his son and gave him you know appointed him and told him that you are a priest for me and of course now for the jewish believers who are listening to this they might have thought but you know we are not able to reconcile this because jesus he never went to the temple he never sacrificed things he came from the tri uh, tribe of juda and all that but the the final authority is who god and god has appointed jesus from the order of melchizedek and it's a better order obviously because even the levitical priesthood from the loins of abraham they have honored the order of melchizedek so he's trying to say that we have a high priest who is so much greater than the priest that you honor among you so you know be confident be bold he just talked about hope isn't it why should we not have hope if we have such a wonderful high priest and he is a high priest for ever so i am at verse 18 once again you know he says that if the law of moses was perfect then there was no need for for uh, you know something new to be brought about but our god on the other hand there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to god but god understood that we need something better than the laws and the uh, the practices that the jews followed because ultimately what were those practices they were all talking about the coming savior so why are you sticking to those traditions when you have the real deal right before you so that is the word that he brought to them now he goes on to talk more about the superiority of this 
high priest, the Lord Jesus, whom we worship. Now, he's, it is told, I'm reading from verse 20, and inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him. So you have to understand that how did the uh, priests through Aaron uh, get their appointment? Just by descent, meaning Aaron, if somebody was born in that generation and you know they fulfilled a certain criteria, they were made into a priest. So there was no qualifier. There was no election there was no choosing there was no appointment in that sense but what is the difference when it comes to the lord jesus he was made priest okay, by the will of god god was the one who decided okay i am going to make jesus the high priest so the lord has sworn and will not relent you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So this is not by birth or descent, but by an oath like God has chosen and God has sworn that he wants to make Jesus the high priest. And this Jesus, he is the surety of a better covenant. Now, if we go back to the covenants that uh, were made earlier, to God's people. Now God promised them, you know, through the covenant, there are many things. You uh, you receive God's forgiveness, you receive God's blessings, you receive God's protection. Okay. Uh, so you receive many things through the covenant that God made. You know, the way he blessed Abraham and said, I'm going to bless you, make you a blessing to the nations. So already it sounds very good the things that God has given his people and the way he led his people. So if you go back to all the covenants, you know, you know that God is a good God and he wanted the blessing on the lives of his people. But think about this. The writer of the Hebrews is reminding these Jewish believers. If you thought the covenant that God had with you is great. The Lord Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So there is a covenant which is even greater. And in the case of a covenant, you know, you always needed, uh, it would be made between two people. Okay? Uh, and uh, as long as, you know, one of them, is there as long as one of them is able to keep the promise it would stay now think about the lord jesus you know, he is a high priest forever and uh, uh, he is appointed by god so his position comes with great authority and surety and such is the one who is the initiator of the covenant so you can imagine okay just in that it seems like a better covenant to us, isn't it? Now, there are many more things as part of this better covenant you know, that uh, really bless the believer. And so there is so much of hope which is being provided uh, in these verses for every believer. We are told that Jesus has become the surety of a better covenant better blessings upon our lives. So why do we look at the earthly challenges and the earthly difficulties and we are ready to give up our faith? So don't do that. Try to understand you know, how deep uh, this, this revelation about Jesus is and how uh, you know sure it is. Nothing can shake it. So your confidence must come from there as a believe, believer. Now, in continuation, he talks about priests and uh, verse 23, where he says, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So again, another additional uh, feature that 
increases our hope and our confidence. He says, all the other high priests died. Okay. But he or the Lord Jesus, who is our high priest now, he continues forever and has an unchangeable priesthood. So under the priesthood of Aaron, you know, after that duration was over, they would change. Okay, so the next person would come in and the next person would come in, so on and so forth. But what is this about Jesus? Unchangeable priesthood and forever. And so the uh, believer is being encouraged. Look, this kind of a priest, you can expect this priest to be there to save no matter uh, what you are going through. So this scripture, uh, Hebrews 7.25, it says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So this high priest is able to save us from, you know, the the... Uh, oppression in the world, every tactic of the devil in the world, you know, all the problems which are created by sin, whatever that is, whatever extent that goes to, we have somebody who can save us. So the term there, save to the uttermost. So what are you experiencing? The hope which we have is incredible. This God is able to save us to the uttermost. Okay? And because of the nature of the priesthood, he is not going to change. You don't have to be afraid that, oh, somebody else will take Jesus' position. Then I have to tell them all over again you know, what I am going through. No, he's going to be there forever and you can depend on him. And also, he adds this as a high priest. He makes He lives to make intercession for them. So what is the kind of intercession that we expect from the Lord Jesus? We know that on the cross, when he died for us, that in itself was a form of intercession. And now with that victory, he stands in the presence of God. So that speaks for us. right? What Jesus has already done is a form of intercession. He's already done it. He stands as our advocate who has uh, acquitted us already or because of whom we have now been set free. And we have been delivered. So this is the kind of high priest whom we have. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll take a small break. We'll come back and we will continue from verse 26. Okay, so let's go for a 10-minute break and we shall be back. 